And so nobody is better positioned to kick off this year's celebration of reflection and looking forward than Peter Clay, her alumnus and our annual lecture speaker this year. So Peter, I would say, is a Renaissance man of why. He's a scientist who integrated as a communicator, and much of his impact can be traced to the Pacific Institute, uh, which he founded in 1987, which has had an incredible history in creating and advancing solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. And some of his most notable accomplishments include analyses at the intersection of climate, water, conflict, and water, and the human rights to water. And his recent book, the comic page you see here, The Three Ages of Water, I recommend to all of you, um, is another wonderful piece of evidence of Peter's capacity to grasp and communicate the wonder and the vastness of water and its impact on our society. In the book, and I expect a little bit tonight, he celebrates water's incredible past, including how it came to Earth, its prehistoric impacts, and its influence on human evolution and societal organization. He reflects on our water present, including um, how our ways of life are facilitated by water technology, how it's in the center of so many conflicts and injustices and our vulnerability to climate change. And finally, he offers a very hopeful and inspiring view of a soft path to our water future, laying out clear-eyed strategies to recognize the human rights water, develop processes to value water, and the importance of equity, protect ecosystem services that the water provides, and maximize its impact on our well-being. So perhaps you can see why we are particularly proud to count Peter among the ranks of our alumni. His work is deeply interdisciplinary. It's, it's steeped in elements of technology, society, climate, and justice. And this has enabled him to have tremendous impact. His work has been used by the United Nations and in human rights court cases. He's a MacArthur Fellow, elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he received a Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization. So I'm greatly honored to present Peter Blake as our annual lecture speaker. I can't tell you how much of an honor it is for me to be here. Uh, thank you, Duncan, for that introduction. I, I probably don't need to give my talk now. <laughs> um, but, but really, it's a thrill uh, to, to be here. And I'm going to talk about water. Uh, but before that, I, I want to talk a, about ERG a, a little bit. Um, it, it's not just an honor to give this talk, but on the 50th anniversary, give or take a year, uh, of ERG, that's a special honor. And uh, there are a lot of friends and old colleagues and, and in the audience, and I'm not going to be able to acknowledge everybody, but really it's great, it, it's, it's great to be here. And thank you to the Roths uh, and to the staff for setting this up. There's been a lot of work that's been done behind the scenes. Uh, ERG is an incredible institution, as I think most of you know. Uh, it's remarkable it's, in, its, in its scope, in its breadth, uh, and it's a home with two key strengths. Its concept of truly interdisciplinary thinking across science and technology and economics and policy and equity, and its remarkable students, and of course its remarkable faculty. And that's been true throughout its history from the beginning. I started to make a list from the alumni list of the countries that ERG students have come from or worked in, and I gave up halfway through. It was basically almost every country you could think of. Across the globe, ERG students have played a role and have had an influence, not just here, but widely around the world, truly a, a global influence. And to say that ERGs have populated or infiltrated uh, society is also an understatement. Uh, public utilities commissions, the United Nations and UN agencies, international energy agencies, US agencies and international non-governmental organizations, newspapers and journalism, universities, of course, uh, social media companies, including Facebook and Google and throughout Silicon Valley, uh, economic and financial firms, national labs, uh, startup companies, the White House, uh, the Office of Science, uh, technology and policy. Pretty much every federal agency has ERG uh, students there. Offices on Capitol Hill, water and air quality control boards, foreign ministries, including at least one uh, foreign minister for water, uh, who is a graduate student colleague of mine, who I actually took to the, his first Grateful Dead concert at, at the Greek. <laughs> So, so to say that ERG changed my life and played and continues to play a central mo role in my life would be an understatement. I came to ERG in 1978 
uh, directly from my undergraduate work. And I got my master's in 1980 with a, a quantitative assessment of the impacts of small hydroelectric facilities on the environment. I then went away for a couple of years uh, to serve as the Deputy Assistant for Energy and Environment for Governor, then Governor Jerry Brown, hired away from ERG by another ERGI, Phil Greenberg, uh, who was then the assistant to Jerry Brown for Energy and Environment. And at the time, I joined in Sacramento a whole set of other ERGIs who were already in Sacramento, changing California's energy and environment scene. Uh, Bob Weisenmiller, Ron Kakulka, uh, uh, and Dave Marcus at the, at the Energy Commission in California, Ken Finney in the governor's office and legal and legislative office, Barbara Barkovich, who was at the PUC, Peter Deibler, the Office of Appropriate Technology, uh, who is my roommate in Sacramento, uh, Jane Hall at the Air Board, and, and many others. And already we had, influ we had infiltrated the system. And with Jerry Brown's help, because uh, he was committed to these issues, made a big deal, made a big difference in energy and environmental policy for the state of California. And ERGIs still do that. I came back to ERG uh, in January of 83 when Jerry Brown left office <laughs> for the first time. Um, and I got my PhD in 86 under John Holdren, uh, modeling the impacts of climate change on water resources. I developed a, a regional hydrologic model for the state of California that integrated output from general circulation models available at the time uh, and drove that hydrologic model to try and get a sense of how climate change would affect water resources in the state. And at that time, I also had the opportunity to publish my first journal articles with John Holdren and Kirk Smith and Irving Mincer and Kent Anderson and Greg Morris, uh, all graduate students and colleagues of mine. And most importantly, I married an Ergi, <laughs> Nikki Norman, uh, who's here tonight. Really, most importantly. Um, I then got a postdoc to stay at Erg for two more years to look at environmental security issues, conflict over resources. And then in October 1987, as Duncan mentioned, uh, with two more ERGIs, I started the Pacific Institute, a nonprofit research and policy group uh, with Ronnie Lipschutz and Mike Maniates. Uh, and I was doing environmental work, and Ronnie was doing political work, and, and Mike was doing development work. And so we had a long name, the Pacific Institute for Studies in Development, Environment, and Security. A, a ridiculous name, <laughs> but that's, that's what it was. And to, even today, the Pacific Institute uh, is a fixture in global environment development and economic policy. And we were doing what we couldn't do in academia, really, what ERG was doing. That is truly interdisciplinary work, trying to cross the boundaries between technology and economics and policy and politics and equity, all of the things that today continue to be central to ERG. So um, I'm, again, honored to be here to celebrate ERG and how important it's been for me personally. So now to the issue of water. We're in a crisis globally, a series of crises more accurately, threatening the health of the planet and our own health. And it's a crisis of our own making, human crisis of our own making. And it's been developing for centuries slowly at first, but accelerating now in different forms and in different places. And it's now reaching a crescendo, and we can all hear it. It's no longer small local problems. It's now global problems, global climate change, political conflict, economic collapse, uh, and of course, ecological collapse. And a core part of that crisis are the challenges and threats associated with fresh water, the planet's hydrologic cycle, and the resources on which we all depend. And the title of my talk, The Three Ages of Water, and the title of my book, which came out last year, uh, addresses that set of crises. But these are crises in the energy world as well. There are crises in the ecological world as well. They're not just water. They're interdisciplinary. They cut across all of the things that we all care about. And so what I'm going to describe is the first age of water, which is the period from literally the creation of the universe, from the Big Bang, 
through the formation of our solar system, the formation of Earth, uh, the evolution of life, the evolution of Homo sapiens on this planet, uh, the development of the earliest societies and the first empires, and the role that water has played throughout that first age. And the second age I'll describe is our age. It's a period of time when humans had to develop the technologies and the institutions and the strategies and the economic policies and approaches to manage and manipulate the hydrologic cycle for our benefit to the benefit of growing populations and economies. And the second age of water is now coming to an end in what I will describe as a series of unintended consequences of the second age, a series of crises. But my argument and my core message tonight is that we're living in a remarkable time, a time when we're in a transition from the challenges that we're all working on to a positive, sustainable future. And my focus is water, but again, I suspect that many of the points I make will resonate with those of you working on energy, or minerals, or climate, or oceans, or a vast array of the social, political, and economic aspects of sustainability. And if one of my messages is that we're now in a transition to a more positive future, another is that we're not going to solve our problems with the, with the policies and the ideas of the second age of water that those policies and those ideas have brought us to the brink of the challenges that we face now. And we're going to have to change the way we think and we're going to have to change the way we do. We need a new way of thinking. And that's what I call the third age, a hope for the future. So what do we really know about water? About what it is, about where it comes from, about the role that it's played in the history of Earth or indeed the cosmos, or in the evolution and development of humanity? And what can history, science, and experience tell us about the potential to solve our water crises and move to a more sustainable future? That's what this story is about. Science tells us that the first hydrogen atoms appeared maybe literally minutes after the Big Bang, maybe a few years or a few thousand years after the Big Bang, we had hydrogen. Oxygen took a little longer, a few million years for the first stars to form and coalesce and then explode, spreading elements throughout the universe, including oxygen. But once we had hydrogen and oxygen, we had water. And today, everywhere we look in the universe, we see water. Water is ubiquitous in far distant galaxies. It's ubiquitous in our own solar system and in asteroids and in comets, in interstellar space, throughout the Milky Way, and as I say, in other galaxies. Ice has been found in the deep craters of Mercury, very close to the sun, in the deep craters where the sun doesn't quite reach. We've seen ice there. We landed rovers on the moon in places chosen because it's close to where we think there's ice in deep craters on the moon. We have seen a lot of water on Mars. Mars used to be very wet. We've seen water vapor and forms of water in the blistering atmospheres of Venus. Uranus and Neptune both have more water on them than is on Earth. They're basically water planets, frozen water planets. And our water on Earth almost certainly came with the primordial gases and dust that created Earth four plus billion years ago. And recently, images from the Cassini mission and from the, J, uh, the JWST telescope have shown uh, uh, water vapor venting from uh, Enceladus, uh, one of the moons of Saturn, which we now think may have all of the elements necessary for life deep in the crust uh, in underneath uh, the frozen edges of Enceladus. And science tells us that without water, there would be no life. Now, of course, we only have one example to choose from. It's our, it's our own. But we know that without water, our life uh, would not be possible. So this is all part of the first age of water. The billions of years from the Big Bang to the formation of our planet to the ultimate evolution of Homo sapiens and the earliest cultures. As early species of hominin evolved, the, the family that includes Homo sapiens, 
evolved in Africa millions of years ago, the presence and absence of water turned out to be critical for the success of Homo sapiens. And the fact that Homo sapiens have succeeded so, so much, so uh, successfully around the planet, is in part because of our ability hundreds of thousands of years ago to manage extremes of climate and weather. In these early years, human populations expanded from a few thousands to the first millions and spread across the globe to the continents of Egypt, Mesopotamia, the floodplains of the Indus Valley in Asia, the great rivers of China across to Australia perhaps 50,000 years ago, and ultimately to the vast rainforests, uh, grasslands, and savannas of the Americas. And these early populations of Homo sapiens created writing and religion and invented agriculture and formed the first empires that began to manipulate the world and the water around them, building the first dams. This is a dam from 2700 BC in Egypt uh, and the first aqueducts. Our earliest ancestors invented intentional irrigation and that permitted society to move from hunter-gatherer civilizations to agricultural fixed civilizations in the great empires. And those early empires created the first water laws and institutions and they fought the first wars over water. The first, the first war we know of uh, over water was in ancient Mesopotamia between two city-states, the city-states of Uma and Lagash, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, where today we still see conflict over water resources. And in the western United States we, today, we have, a, we have a old joke that we may run out of water, but we're never going to run out of water lawyers. <laughs> and it turns out the ancient Mesopotamians had water lawyers also. The ancient Sumerians wrote a code, the first known legal code, called the Code of Urnamu, dated to around 2100 BC, uncovered in cuneiform tablets in the ruins of the city of Nippur. Nippur. Uh, and they had rules for managing water and managing irrigation systems. And the better known famous Code of Hammurabi a few centuries after that also had water laws that governed the rules for managing irrigation systems and fields and punishing farmers who didn't manage their water correctly. And ultimately the first age of water came to an end when rising populations and expanding cities and growing pressures on natural resources demanded that we do something differently, that we forge a new relationship with water. And the answer to those challenges was to be found in the science and engineering and cultural and philosophical blossomings of the civilization that, that defined the second age of water. The second age of water is our age. It's the age we all grew up in. And it encompasses the hydrologic marvels of the Romans and the Greeks that managed to build uh, water transfer systems that would move water tens or even hundreds of kilometers by gravity alone. It, we unlocked the chemical and biological and physical properties of water. We learned what hydrogen and oxygen was. We created the machines and tools and institutions to take advantage of our, that scientific understanding. These are drawings from Leonardo da Vinci describing some of the water machines that he he designed and that were being built at the time to bring water to cities, to manage water, to turn water into energy so that they could, they could mill grain and, and power industries. We built the first dams, not of small scale out of stone and dirt, but the first dams out of, uh, of a gigantic scale out of concrete so that we could store water in wet periods for use in dry periods, we could control floods, we could generate hydropower. And ultimately, in the second age of water, we replumbed the entire planet. We learned about germs and diseases. We learned what water-related diseases were, and we built the treatment plants to collect dirty water and to treat it to a high standard so that we could deliver safe water uh, to our cities. We built aqueducts not tens of kilometers long, dug out of dirt. Uh, and stone like our Mesopotamian and Roman ancestors, but thousands of kilometers long through or over mountains 
and we pumped groundwater from deep underground so that farmers could grow food in places and at times never before possible so that we could meet the food demands of ever increasing populations. And in some senses, the green revolution that we've all heard about from the 1950s and the 1960s was as much a revolution of irrigation technology as it was a revolution of agricultural technology and pesticides and chemicals. It was a revolution that permitted the pumping of groundwater so that we could grow food, massive amounts of food, in India and Pakistan and the Central Valley of California and the Great Plains of the United States. And in this second age of water, we began casting our eyes and then our robots out into space to discover the fact that water was ubiquitous and everywhere in the universe. So modern civilization is built on the advances of the second age of water, and we've all benefited from those advances in countless ways. We're mostly richer. We mostly live longer, healthier lives. And we take it mostly all of that for granted. But we're now also facing a series of adverse unintended consequences of those advances. By the middle of the 20th century, we started to see and understand about the loss of nature, the rise of environmental problems as the Industrial Revolution accelerated and as populations continued to grow exponentially, the first world wars and the first skyrocketing pressure on natural resources, not at the local level, but at the global level. We've entered a period of time that I call peak water. And let me describe what I mean by that in a form of simple curves that every ergy knows and, and uh, is familiar with. So first, a, a remarkable characteristic of water that's a little unusual in, in the resource world is that water is both a renewable resource and a non-renewable resource. You know, we think about energy, we talk about renewable energy, uh, non-renewable energy. Water is both renewable and non-renewable as well. So non-renewable, or Ergies know this, but uh, I'll repeat it anyway. <laughs> non-renewable resources are stock limited. They're, they're limited by the amount of something that you have. Renewable resources are flow limited. Uh, they're not stock limited, they're flow limited. They're, they're limited by your, our ability to capture a flow. Solar energy is a renewable resource from the sun. It's limited only in the sense that there are limits on how much we can capture. And water has similar characteristics. So let me talk about these three curves. So the first is the classic exponential growth curve that is the heart of so many of our problems today. Global population, carbon dioxide concentrations, you could all draw exponential curves, and at the heart of a lot of them, uh, they're, they're driving many of the challenges that we face. The second is this classic exponential curve, a peaking of something and then a, a decline in something. Uh, this is U.S. coal production uh, through 2022 from 1949, showing a growth in coal production, then a decline in coal production. For, and some of these declines are resource uh, driven, some of them are policy and economic driven. There are lots of reasons for them. This is uh, the bottom curve is Atlantic cod showing overfishing and part of an example of the collapse of our ecosystems when we don't understand or we don't care about the consequences of our policies. And the third curve is the classic logistics curve where you have an exponential growth of something and then a leveling off uh, and, a, and a plateau. Market penetration of telephones in the United States. So the telephone was invented and no one had one and then everyone had one and then we all had one and now some of us have more than one, but that, <laughs> that's another story. Or cumulative dam capacity in the United States, storage volume in the United States. We learned how to build big dams in the second age of water and we started to build big dams and there was enormous growth in the construction of dams in the United States in the 20th century and then that leveled off and it leveled off for a lot of different reasons, one of which was we built on all the good dam sites and a lot of not so good dam sites. 
Uh, but also, we started to understand the environmental consequences of building these big dams, and the environmental movement got involved and started to oppose uh, dam construction, which previously had never been objected to. But another example of this logistics curve. So for water, for peak water, we have the same sort of issues. Water is a renewable resource sometimes. And when water is a renewable resource, this curve can apply, where we start to take water out of that renewable resource, for example, the Colorado River, and we take more and more of it. And then we've got it all. And we might want more, but we can't have any more. It's renewable on an annual basis. And it rains again, and it snows in the Rocky Mountains, and, and the Colorado refills, and, and it's renewable as water is. But from a policy and an, and an economic point of view, once you take the entire flow of a renewable resource, you can't have any more. And the real question isn't how can we take it all, but how much ought, to we, ought we to be using? And I'll come back to that in a little bit later. And this is a graph that shows the flows of the Colorado River and shows a bunch of different things from 1905 up until 2015. This is measured at the mouth, almost at the mouth of the Colorado River. And it shows, first of all, the variability of flows in the Colorado. River, water, water flows in rivers are naturally variable. We have wet years and we have dry years. But it also shows as we started to build the big dams on which we rely now of the second age of water, those flows at the mouth of the river started to decrease. And as we expanded agricultural production in the Colorado Basin, as we moved water to Southern California from the Colorado River Basin, less and less water started to reach the mouth of the Colorado until no longer, until no water reached the mouth of the Colorado, except in some extremely wet years. And that's peak renewable water. And more and more basins around the world are experiencing peak renewable water. The Yellow River in China, for many, many years no longer flows to its mouth. It's not a unique problem. So, but water is also sometimes a non-renewable resource, as I, as I mentioned. And in particular, certain groundwater resources are non-renewable. Non-renewable in the sense that we're using them faster than nature recharges them on a time scale of interest to us. Fossil groundwater is a major part of the world's water system. As much as a third of the world's food production today comes from non-renewable groundwater. In China, in northern China, in the Great Plains, in the United States, in the Central Valley of California, we are overdrafting groundwater. And we start to extract groundwater, and we extract more and more of it, and groundwater levels start to drop because it's not being renewed uh, on a time scale that we care about, and then we have to start, withdrawals start to decline again. And that's the fate of overdrafting a non-renewable resource. This is the Great Plains, the Ogallala Aquifer, underlying a bunch of states, Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, showing decreasing groundwater levels over, over time. And already it's starting to affect agricultural production in those areas. And this is this is the same thing for the Central Valley of California. We overdraft massively agricultural production, overdrafts California groundwater by probably a million and a half acre feet a year, a huge amount. Uh, we're now beginning to talk about bringing that under control. But the reality is uh, we're probably going to have to limit some agricultural production in the Central Valley of California if we want to bring groundwater back into balance. And that's a whole separate talk. <laughs> The third idea in peak water is what I call peak ecological water. And this is the idea where uh, the ecological costs of our water use uh, are starting to be apparent. And this is, again, a characteristic of the second age of water. So on the, on the y-axis, on the y we have basically the overall economic and ecological value of using water. And on the x-axis, the amount of water appropriated by humans. So at the very beginning, we start to take water out of a system. And the economic value increases. We put it to use. We grow crops. We make semiconductors. We make things. And the economic value starts to increase. But we reach a point 
of peak eco what I call peak ecological water, where the next unit of water we take causes more ecological damage than it produces economic value. And the total value starts to decline. Now, admittedly, our ability to value ecological services is not very good. And this is, again, something that Dick Norgaard and, and Tony Fisher and some of the early economic professors at, at ERG played an enormous role in defining and trying to quantify and trying to understand. But the reality is ecosystems around the world are now suffering peak ecological water, where the ecological value of what we're getting is, is far less, is, has been damaged to a much greater extent than the economic benefit of using that water. And if we properly valued ecosystems, we would again do things differently. So what does peak water really mean? It doesn't mean we're going to run out of water. Water is mostly, in many places, a renewable resource. But we are hitting non-renewable constraints on certain stocks around the world that are, have major implications for, in particular, food production. We're also hitting renewable flow constraints on more and more rivers where even, even those flows are renewable. And we're hitting or exceeding peak ecological water limits. And these peak constraints, these peak challenges, are at the heart of the crisis that we're facing in the second age of water. Another way to think about this is that starting in the middle of the 20th century, as we started to understand some of these things, uh, we started to think differently about water. Uh, this is a photograph of the 1952 Cuyahoga River fire. This is not the famous Cuyahoga River fire, which was in 1960, okay, I'm gonna forget now, 68 or 69, somebody here knows. Um, the, it turns out there were no good photographs of that that fire, but the 68 fire is the one that basically helped jumpstart the environmental movement in the United States. It was also the same year we had a massive oil spill off the Santa Barbara coast. Uh, and those events, plus the growing environmental movement in general, really helped trigger uh, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the major federal legislations that for the first time started to address some of the uh, the environmental problems uh, uh, for water of the second age of water. But our rivers and lakes were treated as dumps and they started to catch fire. And despite those advances, despite the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act and other legislation, we know that serious problems remain. We're not dealing with the, the plastics problem, which is in part a water problem, not just because we dump plastics in it, but because a lot of these Plastics comes from plastic, plastic water bottles. And I wrote a separate book about that, about bottled water. We have algal blooms, even today, from in the Great Lakes as rising temperatures and our failure to deal with nutrient pollut pollutants uh, are contributing to new kinds of environmental problems in the water system. We now understand the causes of water-related diseases and how to prevent them, but they persist including new illnesses associated with new pollutants that we're not regulating adequately. And I would note actually today in the news, for those of you who follow this, California just passed the first regulations for Chrome 6. Uh, it's been tw 20 years in the making, but the first serious regulations to, to regulate a new pollutant in California. But one of the worst failures of the second age of water is the failure to provide safe drinking water and sanitation services to everyone on the planet. We know how to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone. We figured that out in the second age of water, but one of the failures of the second age is that we aren't doing it. There are two billion people today worldwide that don't have adequate to adequate sanitation services. There are probably 700 or 800 million people that don't have safe drinking water. Uh, and that's one of the major water crises that we face, and it's one of the greatest failures of the second age of water. And it's not just a problem in developing countries. 
It's a problem here in the United States as well. Many of you probably know the story of Flint, Michigan, where we had a water system that provided safe water uh, to Flint, but because of underinvestment, because of corruption, because of mismanagement, uh, frontline communities in particular in Flint, Michigan, suffered serious water quality problems. And this is a problem in Jackson, Mississippi today. It's a problem in the Central Valley of California today where a couple of hundred thousand people, again, frontline communities, mostly farm worker communities, don't have access to safe water and sanitation. Uh, and this is one of the richest countries in the world. And this is a problem that I call water poverty. Uh, one of uh, another example of some of the massive inequities of the second age of water. We're seeing more and more violence associated with water resources. One of the things we do at the Pacific Institute is we maintain something called the Water Conflict Chronology, which is an open source database uh, that tracks water-related violence, going back to that first water war in ancient Mesopotamia in 4,500 years ago, uh, up until the present. This is a, a graph that shows not for 4,500 years, but the last couple of decades of data from the water conflict chronology. Uh, we track water conflicts in three categories. Water is a trigger of conflict, that is disputes over control, access uh, to water, over water rights. Uh, water is a casualty of conflict, where water or water systems are uh, attacked during conflicts, and water as a weapon used during conflicts. And the number of conflicts has increased quite dramatically over the last few years in all of those categories. Peak water limits, of course, uh, are key, as I've already described, to the ecological challenges that we face. Rivers are running dry, aqu uh, aquifers are being overpumped, ecosystems are being destroyed. I've already talked about the limits uh, to food production, and we're going to have to figure out how to continue to grow food for eight plus billion people, uh, but bring our groundwater overdraft under control. We know that we're strip mining the land of forests and the oceans of fish. We're driving uncounted plants and animal species to extinction. And some of the worst extinction crises are aquatic ecosystems because of the water that we take out of those systems. And most worrisome of all, to me, is the threat of global climate change. Uh, again, I've worked for a long time on the issue of climate and water. Uh, we know that the climate is changing. We know that humans are responsible. We know that some of the worst impacts of climate change will be on the water system. The hydrologic cycle that you all remember, of course, from second grade uh, is the climate cycle. And we're already seeing changes in extreme events, uh, changes in increases in floods, increases in droughts, increases in extreme precipitation. Uh, as the hydrologic cycle accelerates. Increases in temperature means higher evaporation rates, more demand for water by agriculture and cities. Uh, the, the implications of climate change for water resources are enormous. In short, the second age of water is a race between the growing risks of ecological collapse, massive e economic inequality, and political conflict, and on the other hand, the growing efforts to apply our harder knowledge and technologies to prevent those crises. It's time to both acknowledge the benefits of the second age of water, which have been enormous, and the need to make a transition to a third age, where we address the growing failures associated with the problems of the second age of water, and make the transition to sustainability. And that transition isn't going to be easy but it's both necessary, and the good news is it's possible. We have two paths before us. One is to that dystopian future that we read about in our sci-fi novels and we see in our dystopian movies, all of which I love to watch and, 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 and read, uh, or to a positive, sustainable future. And just as we can imagine a disastrous future, we can imagine a positive one. And more importantly, just as we can imagine a positive future, we can take the actions necessary to move to that positive future with a balance between humans and nature, with growing equality and social cohesion, and with healthy 
stable societies. And that's the future that I focus on in the third age of water. And I believe this positive vision is not only possible, I actually believe it's inevitable. I think we're going to move to that positive, sustainable future. I'm not arguing that it's going to be easy. I'm not arguing that it's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm not arguing that there isn't going to be a, a whole series of difficult, terrible things that happen between here and there. But I think that we will get there eventually. We're learning how to weave together a tapestry of actions and decisions and policies of individuals and communities and corporations and governments, sometimes in surprising places and surprising ways, to address the unresolved challenges, and the, especially the unresolved water challenges that I've described. And that's what I call the soft path for water. And I called that in part in an homage to Amory Lovins' groundbreaking work on energy. Uh, when I came to ERG, Amory had just written the Soft Energy Paths book, I think in 75 or 76. And when I actually came to ERG in, in the spring of 78 to decide where to go to graduate school, because I, I had some choices, Amory was teaching a seminar here. And I had read The Soft Path for Energy. And there was Amory Lovins at ERG. And I, I sort of had no choice but to come here. <laughs> So the soft path for water that I, I've written about uh, has a number of characteristics. So the hard path, I'm going to contrast the hard path and the soft path for water. The hard path for water in the, in the second age was build water supply, build another dam, build another aqueduct, pump more groundwater, focus on supply. That was how we treated water. And the soft path says, we need to think about supply. We need to figure out how to manage supply. But we need to think about supply differently. We need to think about supply in a way that doesn't require taking more water from natural systems. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. The hard path said satisfy projected demand. And when I went to school, water policy was population's growing, economies are growing. We're going to have growing demand for everything energy, water, minerals. That was just the, the fundamental assumption. The soft path says rethink demand. What do we really want? We don't want water except for drinking, for fundamental survival. We want to grow food. We want to make semiconductors. We want to do things with water. And the argument in the soft path for water is that most or all of the things that we want to do with water, we can do with less water than we're spending to do those things. That's the concept of efficiency. That's the idea of rethinking demand. Don't assume demand is always going to increase. And I'll come back to that too. The hard path says water is an economic good. The soft path says water is an economic good, but let's think differently about economics. But it's also a human right. And the UN declared a human right to water in 2010 after a long debate. And that's, an, that's another lecture. The hard path said centralized water treatment and produce water of one quality, potable water. And that's what's delivered in our pipes. And the soft path says protect water quality and match the quality of the water that we have with the qualities of the water we need. Not everything requires potable water. And so if we rethink water quality, in a different way. New options and new strategies and new policies appear. The hard path said, gave no thought to ecosystems. We didn't care about or we didn't understand the consequences for ecosystems of our water policies. And we know that world is over. We now mostly understand and we mostly care about, at least in this room, the ecological consequences of our water policy. And so we need to protect ecosystem needs, water needs, as much as we protect human uses and needs for water. And the hard path basically had centralized management, centralized institutions, largely engineering systems. And the soft path says, let's manage water differently. Let's design our water institutions differently. Let's include community participation. Uh, let's have water institutions and energy institutions work together, something they traditionally don't do. So that's sort of a over, quick overview of the hard path. But the reality is, in the third age of water, we can provide safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet. No new technology needs to be invented. 
The economic costs of providing safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet are far less than the economic costs of failing to do so. Economic costs, I, I would say, are mostly borne by women and, and girls and disadvantaged communities. And we've learned that the economic benefits of providing safe water and sanitation greatly outweigh the costs of providing those services. And that's one of the objectives of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 6. One of those targets is provide safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet by 2030. And I don't think we're going to meet it. We could. I don't think we will by 2030. But we will meet it eventually, in my opinion. We know how to use water more productively to do the things that we want. Already, our toilets and washing machines and dishwashers are more efficient than they were 20 years ago. They use less water and less energy and less detergent, and they produce less wastewater. Uh, we're making semiconductors with a lot less water now than we used to. Uh, we're growing more and more food with less water because of improvements in the agricultural sector. Uh, California farmers are producing more income and more revenue today, much more income and much more revenue today, with the same amount of water they were using 30 years ago. Uh, and that potential to do more is the efficiency revolution uh, that I've hinted at. And it's the way to rethink, it's the, the key uh, to rethinking demand. We also know that changing our diets have an, has an enormous influence on our water footprints. A meat diet is hugely more water intensive than a vegetarian diet. Uh, and already there are changes in diets around the world that are having slowly an impact on our water footprint. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic about all of this is that I think we're already in this transition to the third age of water. And for those of you who have ever heard me talk before, you've, you've seen this graph because I show it all the time. I love this graph. This is a graph of uh, for the United States of two things. The gross national product of the United States from, from 1900 to 2015. The gross national product of the United States that shows that exponential growth in economy that economists, some economists love to see, not all, and total water withdrawals in the United States for everything. Water for power plant cooling and agriculture and industrial use and our home use for, for everything. And it shows a lot of different things. But one of the things it shows is that up until about 1970, mid-1970s, those two curves rose together. Population, which isn't graphed here, but would show the same exponential growth. And the economy grew exponentially. Water use grew exponentially. And then something happened in the mid-70s. And those two curves split apart. And today in the United States, we use less water for everything than we used in 1970. That, that water curves dropped down. And if those curves had continued to rise together, we would have had to more than double water withdrawals in the United States compared to what we're, we're using today. And I don't know where that water would have come from. We were already using all of the Colorado River. We were already overtapping groundwater in the Great Plains and in, and in California. Um, you know, we, that, that change was unexpected, and it's an indication of improvements in efficiency and changes in industrial policy and changes in the way we deal with wastewater. Uh, and it's a remarkable example, in my opinion, of this transition to the third age of water and why I believe we're already moving in that direction. We know how to treat water to the highest possible standard. We collect a lot of wastewater, we treat it to a high standard, and then traditionally, we've thrown it away. We dump it in the ocean. Um, that is an example of rethinking supply that I mentioned when I talked about rethinking supply in the soft path. That's a source of water. It's an asset, not a liability. And we need to, to think about reusing wastewater in a comprehensive way. And again, we're starting to do that. Singapore collects and treats its wastewater, 100% of its wastewater, and they reuse it. Uh, some of that water is so pure, they actually reuse it for their semiconductor industry, which requires ultra-pure water. 
Uh, Israel collects and treats and reuses 80 or 90 percent of its wastewater, mostly for agricultural purposes. California collects and treats and reuses about 18 percent of our wastewater now, and we have policies uh, to double that. That's a new source of supply. It's relatively drought proof. We can produce water of any quality that we want. Uh, right now, most of California's reused water goes to agriculture or to groundwater recharge or to industrial uses, but we're now talking about potable reuse, about treating water to a potable standard and reusing it. And uh, it doesn't require taking more water from our overdrafted rivers and our overdrafted aquifers, and that's a new potential source of supply. And ultimately, of course, we could desalinate water. 97% of the water on the planet is salt water. It's too salty to drink, it's too salty to use to grow crops, but we know how to desalinate water. The technology is pretty well understood and it's in wide application in certain parts of the world. It's very energy intensive. It produces environmental problems, including the disposal of the brine, the uh, intense brine that is, is produced. But we know how to deal with those problems. It just increases the cost of desalination. So desalination is, again, a new potential source of supply when we've done the other things that I think are cheaper and more important, including efficiency and reuse and more capture of stormwater. We're learning how to protect and restore natural ecosystems. We're beginning to guarantee water for ecosystems, something that we didn't do in the 20th century. And we're beginning, finally, to remove some of those dams of the second age of water that we have decided are too ecologically damaging now as we understand the ecological consequences of our use. This is the Elwha Dam on the Elwha River in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, until this year, this was the largest dam removal project in the United States. This was a big dam that was built on the Elwha River for a, the logging industry. It produced a little bit of electricity. It provided water for the logging industry. And it destroyed a salmon uh, fishery in the Pacific Northwest. And we removed the Elwha Dam. And this is what the river looks like now. And the salmon are already spawning miles upstream of that dam site. And this year in California, we launched what is now the biggest dam removal project in history on the Klamath River. And we're removing four big dams on the Klamath River. Again, dams that are no longer economically viable compared to the ecological value that a free flowing river provides. We're slowly coming to grips with the need to resolve disputes over water diplomatically and peacefully rather than with violence. So the coming years are going to determine how we choose to make that transition to a third age of water, whether we slip down into that grim and dismal future that we can imagine, or whether we solve the crises that afflict us and make that shift to a sustainable, just, and peaceful world. And as I said earlier, I'm convinced that it's both possible and uh, necessary and that the transition is indeed underway. And I've, again, I've worked with individuals and communities and, and people around the world doing the smart, innovative things that in pieces are the transition to the third age of water. And what we have to do is we have to learn how to scale them up and we have to learn how to overcome the barriers that still remain. I don't think there are any technological roadblocks. I don't think there are economic roadblocks that would prevent a positive third age of water. But whether we can overcome the political obstacles, some of the social and cultural obstacles that remain uh, depend on the choices that we make and how quickly we act. So in closing, uh, let me read a few. Oh, this is, the, this is the removal of the first dam on the Klamath, Klamath River this year. So in closing, let me read a few sentences from the last section of, of my book. I believe that a positive future in the third age of water is not only possible, but inevitable. Indeed, this optimism has permitted me to continue working on the critical challenges of climate and water and sustainability. Perhaps that's because the alternatives, the dystopian visions of our sci-fi novels and apocalyptic movies and pessimistic doomsayers are simply too depressing to accept. It would be a cosmic shame if alone in this small corner of the universe, our spark of intelligent life was not quite intelligent enough to overcome the challenges of living on a finite, delicate planet and fell back into a dark age of chaos, or worse, 
went the way of the dinosaurs. That's possible, but it needn't be that way. If we fail to achieve the positive vision for water, it won't be because we can't. It will be because we didn't. The hopeful vision of water that I offer here is achievable and reachable, and pieces of it are already apparent in innovative, successful water efforts underway around the world. That's a future worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Um, 20 minutes or so to uh, discussion and Q&A with uh, Peter. And um, go ahead and raise your hands if you have questions. And we have a few speakers in the room, or uh, helpers in the room, and we'll bring the mic to you. Um, and we'll begin with John. Peter, wonderful talk. Um, to be optimistic about our water future really means you also have to be optimistic about our climate future. Are you? <laughs> okay, so, so, so for those of you who don't know, this is John Hart. Um, John Hart was actually on my dissertation committee uh, uh, and has given two of these lectures, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, so thank you, John, for your question. Um, so I did say that I didn't think we would reach the third age of water without a lot of pain. Uh, I'm not. I'm an optimist, but I'm not, I think, a blind optimist. And, and I know that there's, this is a difficult path we're all on. That's why, that's why we're all here. Um, I do think we'll get the climate situation under control, but not without some irreversible, irreversible bad consequences. Uh, one of the things we did at the Pacific Institute, I should have mentioned this, at the Pacific Institute, I, th I think over the years, this is our 37th year, we've, we hired, I think, 18 ergies. Uh, over the time, uh, including um, Heather Cooley, who's here, uh, who's our director of research. Um, uh, there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering. We're going to have an irreversible sea level rise. We're already seeing damages to the oceans. Uh, we're going to have, I, I don't need to go over the litany of problems associated with climate. Um, I am somewhat optimistic at the rate now at which renewable energy is being deployed worldwide. The, the truth is renewable energy now is so much cheaper than even existing, op operating existing coal plants. That, you know, 10 years ago, that, that was not on the, on the table. Um, so I'm optimistic that, that we will eventually and hopefully quickly decarbonize uh, our economy. Um, but there are going to be some adverse consequences. Uh, again, I think this is a long-term long problem. So another thing I haven't talked about, I, I hinted at it. Um, and I'm not going to be around for this one either. By the end of this century, I think world population is going to peak and then it's start, going to start to decline. And that's a stunning idea. That's unheard of in the history of Homo sapiens, uh, except maybe, I don't know, 50,000 years ago when there was some pandemic. I, I don't know. But the decline in population offers an opportunity, terrible challenges, but also opportunities to do things differently. Um, so it's, again, this is a, it's a long path, and I'm optimistic for the long term. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, in, in California, um, we have a lot of fights for our water between various legitimate uh, stakeholders, cities, farms, fish, etc. Um, how do you feel about rewriting our water laws to do a better job of managing our water in California? Because historically, a lot of our water laws were written by people from an Eastern perspective or English water law, and we live in the West where it's arid and dry, and we have 30% year-to-year variation in rainfall. And I, what's your feeling for that? So the Pacific Institute does, we work on global water issues. We do a lot of work on Western water issues in California. Um, uh, We've done a lot of the soft path work. We, we did the first analysis, comprehensive assessment of water conservation and efficiency potential in California in the urban and agricultural sector, the potential for stormwater capture, wastewater reuse. Uh, so we've, we've looked a lot about at California water issues. And one of the, and I should have I probably hinted at this, one of the biggest barriers to the third age of water, I've said aren't technological, aren't economic, they're institutional. 
Uh, and one of the big barriers to really solving California's water fights is our water laws, uh, our traditional, the, water, the way water rights were given out. It continues to be the third rail of California water politics. We have a lot of water lawyers um, who like to defend that. And, and uh, I would love to see some, some changes in California water law. Uh, I didn't think 10 years ago that we would ever have groundwater law in California, but we do now. Again, circumstances prevailed. Uh, we had a severe drought. <laughs> we had a lot of severe droughts, but we had a severe drought coinciding with a pretty democratic uh, 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 legislature, and they passed what's called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, the first time California had groundwater law to regulate groundwater. And it's difficult to implement, and there are challenges implementing it, but but that was a change, and I have hopes that we will perhaps rethink some of the California water rights, rights laws. Um, I'm not holding my breath on that one, but maybe eventually. Uh, but even without that, I think there, there are a lot of solutions to California's water challenges. So I'm, I'm optimistic there too. Thank you, Peter. It was a great, great presentation. I had two questions. One, you had the curve that you liked so much. Um, in 1970, you know, we, we, the, the, there was the, the separation between demand and um, growth. Was that because we had no choice? You also mentioned that there was no, there was no, there was no more water to get it to, to grow. So it was, it was uh, an absolute necessity. So we re reacted to a necessity. That's one question. The second was, you mentioned a, a, an opportunity for capturing rain runoff as one of the ways to enhance supply. Is there any examples of that um, that are going on in California or elsewhere that you could, you could cite, be interested to know? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so on the first one, there's a lot going on in that graph <laughs> behind those curves. Um, we passed the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act in the, in the 60, or late 60s, early 70s. One of the things that did was it required industry for the first time to treat wastewater. They couldn't just dump their river, their crap, that's a technical term, into the Cuyahoga River and, and let our rivers burn. And industry learned pretty quickly that in fact, it was far cheaper to use less water and produce less wastewater than to treat the volumes of wastewater that they, were produ that they had been producing. So that's part of what was going on then. Um, part of what was going on is an improvement in efficiency. We passed the first efficiency standards for technologies. Um, part of it is a change in the industrial makeup of the United States. A lot of the heavy water using industries moved offshore. And so our water footprint may have stayed the same, but a lot of it turned out to be water now that the Chinese were using to produce the goods and services rather than internally. So there's really a lot going on that drove that. Um, but even in China now, for example, they're cutting their water use and their economy continues to grow. Their population, well, their population is beginning to level off too. But there's a lot going on in that, in that curve. Um, in terms of uh, new thinking about supply, may, maybe the best way to answer this is that one of the things California could do more of is what we call stormwater capture. We, we know that climate change is happening. We know we're getting more extreme droughts and floods. We know that we're not very good at capturing stormwater. You know, we built the massive reservoir system that does capture a huge amount of stormwater, um, but there's no more reservoir storage to be built. We might build sites reservoir. We might build one more big reservoir in California, but we're not going to be able to fill it in many years because we aren't going to get the water for it. But we overdraft groundwater in the Central Valley. And if we could capture more storm water when we get it, then that's a new source of supply. It's, uh, it's a way of expanding the water that's available to us without destroying more ecosystems. And there are examples underway. There are case studies and experiments underway in the Central Valley to move levees back from rivers. We levy, we've levied a lot of our rivers and that pushes the water out to the ocean faster. So if you move those levees back and let the, slow the water down, we're working with farmers to expand the potential to flood fields during the winter to enhance groundwater recharge. That's, that's one, one example. There are some efforts underway to intentionally recharge groundwater by pumping water when we have it. Um, I'm not sure what the potential for that is. But the Pacific Institute has studied the potential for stormwater capture in the urban areas. 
Uh, we're doing a national study right now of the potential to expand some of these things. So may maybe those are some examples. Um, thanks again for that great talk and especially the positivity. So I appreciate you taking the path of positivity in your, co in your book and conversation. When I think of water, I think of a healing element for our bodies, our planet, for creatures around us. But I also think of the toxicity in the water. So I'm curious whether in your book or in your studies, you have looked at the toxicity that mostly contributed by humans through pharmaceutical, industrial, or a microplastic, and if you have any thoughts on that in terms of the next phase, the third age of water, what's our role? I was just hoping that nature would take care of it on its own because it's such a vast problem. So I'd be curious what your thought is. Thanks. So one of the things that I, I loved writing this book, I, I got to delve into the, into the evolution of Homo sapiens and the role that water played and climate played. And there's a section in the book about the spirituality of water. And every religion, every, uh, every origin story of, from native communities, water's, water is central to all of that. It's such an important part of, of how we think about water. And the truth is, humans care about, about water. If you look at every public opinion poll about the environment, water and concerns about water are always at the top. They've been at the top for decades. Um, and in terms of water quality, obviously the most important thing is to stop putting bad things in water. And, and we've, started to, we've started to stop putting bad things in water, but we still put bad things in water. I, and I showed the picture about plastics and I talked a little bit about our, still, our continuing failure to deal with nitrates uh, and phosphates and, and agricultural chemicals. And there are lots of other chemicals that we continue to, don't, to fail to regulate and fail to remove from water resources. The fact that we're just now um, regulating chromium-6 is, is hexavalent-6 is, 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 is bad. The fact that we're regulating it is good, but the fact that it's taken so long and there's so many other chemicals that we don't regulate is, is bad. And so part of the third age of water is going, to have to be, is going to have to deal with that. We have to stop contaminating water resources. That expands our health, it improves our health, it improves ecosystem health, it expands the amount of water that's available for humans and ecosystems to use. Um, but but we, haven't, we haven't gotten that under, under control yet. Um, thank you so much, Current Ergi here, and very, very inspired. Um, you talked a lot about the how we failed in the second age of water, but I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about why we failed and maybe what you anticipate will be the biggest surprises or what our biggest blind spots are as we go into this third age of water. Yeah, so there, there are lots of reasons why the benefits of the second age of water have now, are now in a sense being overcome by the unintended consequences. And I described the unintended consequences and there are lots of reasons. Um, one of the most important is, is the fact that we didn't value ecosystems. We didn't understand the consequences of our actions for the natural environment. Uh, we just took the water where we found it and where we wanted it and we moved it to where we wanted it and we put wastes in it and contaminants in it and, and that's produced all sorts of bad things. And a lot of the ecological problems that we face have water at their heart. You know, it's the same with climate change. The unintended consequences, fossil fuels were great. They helped drive our economies and we didn't understand the climate consequences and the other environmental consequences of burning fossil fuels. And, and we do now, uh, just as we sort of understand the, some of the water consequences. So economics was play, also played a part in this. Uh, ecological economics is a new field, relatively speaking, and it's an attempt to overcome some of those failures of the second age of water. Uh, you know, another reason is our institutions were sort of focused on, on just meeting human demands and they were very narrowly created. Uh, someone once said, I, I, forget, I forget who, although I think it's a quote in my book, um, uh, and I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but the basically, basically the idea is that we have, we have uh, 19th century, uh, 20th century institutions and 19th century thinking and 21st century problems. So we have to redesign our thinking and we have to redesign our institutions.
Um, thank you so much for the talk. I have a, a kind of related question, sort of extending this line of thinking. I was curious if you could unpack the, uh, the GDP portion of your favorite chart. I think a lot of um, thinkers are acknowledging GDP is a really imperfect measure of human prosperity and, you know, the construction of GDP and its sort of spike owing to the ways that we conceive of like what the benefits of the economy are. And, you know, I think about other versions of that curve. California is very proud of its negative GHG emissions and growing GDP. So what are, would you say, are the most exciting new measures of prosperity for thinking about sort of distributional challenges in the third age? What are the, you know, is it merely this problem of how do policymakers better value things that weren't previously valued? How convincing are you finding those measures are in policy debates? Um, what are the sort of emerging metrics and practices that you feel are sort of most promising for being able to capture these really much more nuanced conversations that cross a lot of different scales? So I can give at best a terrible answer to that question. <laughs> I'm not an economist. Uh, all Everything I know about economics I learned from Tony Fisher and, and Dick Norgard uh, here. Um, there's no doubt that GDP and gross, gross national product, gross domestic product is just a, ter a terrible measure. It, it doesn't include the things we really care about. It measures bad things. You know, you break your arm, and GDP goes up. You destroy an ecosystem G G to produce some industrial goods and services, GDP goes up. And Herman Daly wrote about this a long, long time ago in his book Steady State Economics, which was a Bible for some of us trying to, trying to get a handle on rethinking economics. And, and I don't know much more about it. There are lots of new metrics. The UN has set up a whole set of new metrics and measures uh, for uh, human well-being and the, 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 the development index that, that the UN produces is a good example. Um, countries don't tend to use it. We're still stuck on traditional economics. Um, I would love to see a transition away from these old imperfect perfect measures of economics toward something that actually measures important things that we, we care about. Um, that's one of the difficult transitions that, that hasn't happened yet. So I have to leave it at that. Peter, hi. Um, all of this optimism isn't going to get us there by itself. <laughs> and the more I hear about this, and it's all the time, it makes me more of a pessimist all the time. And the reason is, it's not just the first derivatives are going in the wrong direction, the second derivatives are going in the wrong direction. Which means that a whole lot of the indicators are accelerating in the wrong direction. Even turning that around is going to be hard. And I'm worried that all too many of these things are going to get out of hand. I'm talking about for the planet. And it will be too late to turn it around. And I mean, I'm an old guy, and so it's not going to happen in my lifetime anyway. But that pessimism has become intensely more, um, more difficult in the, in the last decade for me. And I don't, know, I don't know whether I'm alone in this, because as I said I'm an old guy. But... In fact, all the indicators, I, I can come up with 20 indicators that matter, and all but one or two of them are going in the wrong direction, and as I said, often with the second derivative. So uh, just to use a bad pun, I'm going to rain on your parade. <laughs> but um, but now, now, now there's two things to say. People like the Urgies and not, we're not alone in this world, but people like the Urgies have had a big impact on making sure it isn't even worse. Thank the Lord for that. But I don't think there's, I, I just don't think it's enough. And that makes me very, very pessimistic. Do you have a comment about that? Okay, so be <laughs> before, I, before I respond to that, uh, this is Bob Budnitz, Dr. Budnitz. Um, Bob is probably the world expert on nuclear safety worldwide. Uh, uh, longtime friend and colleague. Um, and I have a little story about Bob, which I will share. <laughs> Bob, you asked for it. Um, when I was at ERG in 1979, Three Mile Island happened. 79, Bob? Um, 
That was, needless to say, a big news story, especially for us at ERG. And we were getting literally real-time updates on what was happening at Three Mile Island from Bob Budnitz, who at the time was at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and was, I don't know if you were actually in Pennsylvania, but who was getting literally real-time updates. So we, we knew what was happening in real time from, from Bob. Anyway, um, so, you know, there's plenty of pessimism and there's plenty of bad things happening. And you're right, the first derivative is going in the wrong direction and lots of second derivatives are going in the wrong direction. We're accelerating in, in many ways. But, but in the long run, I'm an optimist. I have, I have to be, or else I'm gonna go home and, and just watch dystopian movies, or, or I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, but I also see the positive things that are happening. And that, that's what, this is what gives me hope. And this is what I, I talk about in the third age. I see the, the urges everywhere and the innovative things communities are doing and the things that people try that don't work and then, the, and then they try something different and it does work. Um, and so that, that's what gives me optimism. I answered John, John Hart at the beginning. I said, look, I know there's gonna be a lot of bad things that happen between now and potentially a positive future. We just have to work harder and faster I think I'm gonna go ahead and let Peter uh, finish there with that last hopeful comment. If you have more questions, uh, please uh, join us uh, downstairs uh, for some food and drink. And uh, let's give Peter one more round of applause.